Hi, so I'm, I'm Jira Lello and I'm going to talk to you today about co-infection and more specifically about how we might predict co-infection. Now co-infection is when more than one parasitic species or pathogen species infects the host. And I'm going to use those two terms interchangeably for, because for me parasites and pathogens are the same thing. They're just any kind of organism that can infect the host and cause damage to that host. And those relationships can be both positive, like our, our um, parasite friends down here, or they can be negative relationships depending on what the parasites are doing within the host. So why co-infection is important is because it's absolutely everywhere. So in the Western world, we tend to think, oh, I've got cold, or I've caught this infection or that infection. We treat, in fact, medically and veter in a veterinary context, we tend to treat all organisms as if they are singly infecting a host. But that just isn't the, the truth. So the majority of organisms on Earth are co-infected, and that includes humans, particularly in the developing world. So our innocent little mouse here, for example, may be infected with hantavirus. Now, this is a zoonotic pathogen that's important to humans, so we might be interested in this one parasite. But if that mouse is infected with hantavirus, which is a relatively rare infection, it's almost certainly infected with a pile of other microparasites as well, and a plasma in the blood cells, up to spira floating around in the blood, coccidia in its gut. But in addition to all of those parasites, there are also what we call macroparasites. And macroparasites are multicellular organisms, and these include worms like um, the cestodes and the nematodes, and also ectoparasites, lice, ticks, fleas, all of these things. And this little mouse, it's no exaggeration to say, could be carrying all of these, or many more, or in combinations of lots of other parasites all at the same time. And this is also true for humans, particularly in the developing world, where, where infection with um, worms is particularly common, and also ectoparasites. So why does that matter? Well, the thing is that when organisms get together, they tend to interact with one another. And this is true in our macro ecosystems. If we look at a, a forest ecosystem or a savanna or any other ecosystems, the thing that drives those ecosystems is the mutualisms and competitions between the organisms within it. And the parasites are no different. The only difference is that for them, we're the ecosystem. Okay? So those parasites meet in us and interact with one another. And that matters because those interactions can alter important things to us. So they can alter the severity and the duration of a disease. They can change the treatment success. So for example, we published some, a paper some years ago showing that if you had a simple relationship between three parasites and we vaccinated against one of those parasites, just by manipulating the relationships between the other parasites, we could change the efficacy of that vaccine, making it completely useless or making it really efficacious. Not by changing the vaccine in any way, but only because we changed the relationships between the parasites in the system. It can also alter the probability of transmitting a disease from one person to the next or one animal to the next. So we published some work from cockroaches back in 2013 where we showed that a macroparasite in the cockroach used lipid resources within that cockroach, meaning that those resources were not available to an epidemic parasite that came in. Consequently, only half of the transmission stages, the stages that go on to the next host, were, came out of those cockroaches with a co-infection with the macroparasite. And the reverse can happen as well. We could have facilitation of epidemic diseases. And so given that the majority of organisms are infected with macroparasites, these kinds of effects on epidemics and, and so forth can be very, very important. So the problem is big. Most things are co-infected, and those co-infections, the interactions between parasites can vastly alter what's going on in that infection. But the problem is there are millions of parasites. If we think about all of the organisms on Earth, almost everything is parasitized, even the fungi are parasitized. And so there are countless pathogens. In fact, there are three new pathogens identified in humans alone every two years. And the majority of the wildlife parasites are virtually unstudied. So not only have we got all of these parasites, but they can all mix in combinations, in lots lot of complex combinations. And so actually, what we know about interactions is the very tip of the tip of this iceberg. What we don't know about them, whether and how parasites are interacting, is pretty much unknown. It's that whole base of the iceberg there. So what do we do about that? So we have a big issue because it 
we are increasingly understanding that co-infection can't just be ignored, as we've done for many, many years in, in uh, veterinary and clinical settings. We have to start understanding what's going on, but how do we go about doing that? So trying to puzzle out how these interactions occur, the first question that is, well, how do they interact? What, what causes parasites to interact? And the first one we've just discussed on the previous slide is resource competition. One parasite may either free up a resource in a host for the other parasite, or it may take that resource away from the other parasite. An unusual one is that the, they can change the demography of host populations. So a macroparasites can alter um, the fecundity and survivorship of host populations, changing that whole demography of the host. There's a particular thing that we see with macroparasites, which don't, don't normally see with microparasites. And those microparasites are the ones that tend to cause epidemic infections. So a host population that's full of macroparasites is going to be a very different environment to a host population that isn't full of macroparasites for that emerging epidemic. And the finally, and the one that I'm going to focus on today, is host immune interactions. So going back to our little mouse, we have all of these parasites. Every single one of those parasites will cause some reaction within the host, cause some change. Even if you just stab yourself with a little, um, uh, with, a, with a thorn and there's nothing on that thorn, if it's a clean thorn, still your body will react to it. Any kind of foreign object in, the, in your body, the, you will react to. But we don't react to everything in the same way. And there are lots of different branches and arms of the host immune response. But <clears throat> to give you an example, there are subsets of cells called T cells in the body which uh, produce different immune responses, are, are responsible for different parts of the immune response. The T helper 1 cells, or TH1 cells, they promote responses that are generally, generally attacking microparasitic infections. The TH2 cells, T helper 2 cells, are generally attacking macroparasitic infections. So why does that matter? It matters because those interrelating parts of the immune system co-regulate one another. So for example, with the Th1 and Th2 response, if we promote a strong Th1 response, we, we push down the Th2 response and vice versa. So automatically, we have a mechanism by which these parasites can interact. If, if the immune response that attacks Th2 is pushed down, obviously you've got more chance of catching or continuing with a, with a macroparasitic infection. And of course, there are far more subtleties to that than that to the, to the story. That's a broad scale approach. Great, so we've got this mechanism. Some pathway, we know an awful lot about how the immune system cells interact with one another and the components of the immune system interact. What we don't know is often, for most parasites, how parasites interact with the host immunity. All right, so we know we have this underlying mechanism, but it's hard to access that mechanism. <coughs> However, hope is not lost, because immune responses are not a random process, okay? We don't produce a, an individual, completely different response to every parasite that comes in. There are patterns to it. And so we've proposed a new method by which we might begin to understand and predict co-infection. And that is that we've, we apply four questions to in order to group parasites and using those groups to then try and understand how they may interact with host immune response and therefore with one another. So the first question is an obvious one. What kind of parasite do we have? Do we have protozoan parasites? Do we have bacteria, helminths, viruses, fungi, ectoparasites, prions? What kind of parasites do we have in the host? We've already said that there's this broad Th1, Th2 response to micro and macro parasites, but there are more, more responses. So there's a Th17 response, attacks viral cell viral, um, pathogens, and so on. So there's, there are these overarching stories of which kind of pathogen you've got, but those individual responses are then moderated by some other aspects. And one of those aspects is where do I live as a parasite? Am I sitting in the lumen of the gut? Am I invading the tissues? Am I invading organs? Am I floating around in the bloodstream? Am I actually inside a cell in the, blo in the blood? Where I am can have an effect on how the immune system responds because there are different immune components in different parts of the body. Thirdly, what do I do when I'm in that location? Am I just sitting in the lumen? Am I invading the tissues of the gut? Am I 
sitting in the extracellular matrix of the, of the blood or am I inside the cells? Am I just a little head louse sitting there doing very little except pooping on your head and making it a little bit itchy? Am I, am I doing any, anything in there that's important? And interrelated with that is how much damage do I do? So these are our separate points, but still interrelated. So if I, obviously if I'm in the gut and I'm just sitting in the gut eating your food, I'm going to be doing less damage than if I invade your tissues. But two pathogens that invade the tissues can also do different levels of damage. So one might actually eat tissue, another might just sit in between the interstitial cells. So combining all of those questions together can start to give us a clue about how the host might want to respond to that parasite can certainly give us a way of grouping parasites together. So let's apply this grouping technique to some parasites. So here we have Graphidium strigosum. It's a helmet. More specifically, it's a nematode of the Trichostrongolidae family. It lives in the stomach of the rabbits. What it does there is it burrows into the, um, into the capillaries and feeds on the blood. Because of that, it does a lot of damage. So not only does it thin the, the cell walls, and sit, sorry, the stomach wall, but it also causes anemia and, and heavy blood loss. So it's a very damaging pathogen. We might therefore assume that the host would want to respond robustly to this parasite. So we have group one, our parasite grouping, damaging blood feeding nematodes living in the stomach. Okay. Here we have another nematode, which we're going to assign to a different group. So this one is still a helminth, it's a nematode and it's a Trunchostrongolidae. But this one lives in the small intestine, not in the stomach. It feeds on mucus and, and bacteria, not on blood. And it does limited damage, so it limited tissue invasion. And in fact, most of the damage caused by this pathogen is not the pathogen itself, but the immune system overreacting to it. So this is our group two, browsing intestinal nematodes, limited damage. Now, we can assign other parasites to the group based on those criteria, same criteria. So we want a blood feeder that lives in the stomach and that is damaging, or we want a, a mucosal browser living in the small intestine that's not doing so much damage. Now, understanding then how that relates to the immune response requires us to take another step. So from, I've said already that we know very little about how most parasites interact with the immune response. But for most of these groups that we can produce, we can think of example organisms that, that we do know about. So this is what we're going to do here. We're going to say, well, Graphidium and, and Trichostrongolis in the rabbit, we know about, we know some stuff. So that paper I showed you on vaccines earlier, this was the background to it, which was a study in wild rabbits. So what we have here, just to explain, is rabbit weight, which is a proxy for age on the bottom axis, and the intensity of these two different parasites on the y-axis. And what we see is that for Tira tautoformis, we see this curve, this turnover, and what that's indicative of is the host immune response kicking in. So the host attacks this parasite and kicks it out. Now we expected a much stronger response against the blood feeder, which is this bottom line. We don't see it. It's not about the, the difference in height to the peaks here, because that, that's just different numbers of parasites. The Graphidium are much bigger, chunkier blood feeding waves, but there's less of them. But what we see is that that curve doesn't turn over. So for the lifetime of the rabbit, the infection just keeps increasing. So why might that be? Why is the host that's been really severely damaged by this parasite not apparently responding to it? To understand that, we have to go to the parasite numbers within the host. So this was uh, there were five different common parasites of the rabbit gut. And we looked at the interactions between all of them. Just focus on the ones in the red ring here, those two that we're looking at, Graphidium and Trichostrongolis. What we see is that when Graphidium, the blood feeding worm, is there, we increase the number of the intestinal browsing worm. But when the intestinal browsing worm is there, we decrease the number of the blood feeding worm. So putting that together with what we just saw in the age intensity curves, what we propose here is that the Graphidium, the blood feeding worm, should be being attacked by the immune system and doesn't appear to be. What we propose is that it is suppressing the immune system of the host. And that is explaining this relationship. So Graphidium suppresses immunity, which allows the trichostrongolis to increase. Eventually, we've already seen trichostrongolis is a, a strong immunostimulator. Eventually, although suppressed in co-infection, trichostrongolis has its effect and negatively affects that Graphidium. So the immune system wakes up to the fact that Graphidium is there. If we're right about this, and if we're right about the groupings, what we should now be able to do is go to a new species, in a new host and say, do we see the same pattern? 
So that's exactly what we did. <coughs> we said, OK, we've got Confidio and Trichostrongolis. The first one suppresses the immune system against the second, so the blood feeding damaging worm suppresses intestinal immunity, having a positive effect on the browser. The browser promotes intestinal immunity and has a negative effect on the blood feeder. So next we said right to take two separate parasites. We took Homonchus contortus, and this is a blood feeding worm in the stomach or the abomasum of the sheep. And we took another sheep parasite, Trichostrongus colubriformis, which like the trichs in the rabbits is a mucus and bacteria feeder living in the small intestine. And we made some predictions. We said, OK, the first prediction is that in co-infection, T. colubriformis will, numbers will go up and homonchus numbers will go down, and that that interaction will be immune-based, just as we described. So we did this experiment in infecting sheep. This was in, in Australia some years back. And this is the uh, results of the parasite numbers of the trichostrongus, so that small intestinal worm, the browser. And what we see, the blue line, is the classic turnover that we see in an immune reaction. Okay, so the, the worms come in, we stop dosing at about day 70, okay, and the adult worms start then to be kicked out of the host. The red line is the mixed infection, and in this case we see no reduction in the, in the worm counts. So once we've reached our maximum worm numbers, we stay at a plateau. Absolutely no evidence that the immune system is being effective against the adult worms in this particular system. And agreeing with our hypothesis, so there are more worms in the trichostrongus mixed infection than there are in the single infection. And indeed, we also see that that is an immune-based interaction. So in the small intestine, so where the trichostrongus lives, the immune response is suppressed in all cell types. I'm just showing you a few here. But all of the cell types that we measured are suppressed when there is a co-infection. Okay, so the mechanism is there. The story for the homonchus is a little less exciting in that we do see the pattern that we expected, but it's not as strong. So the homonchus, we see that the adult worms are actually not affected in this group, at least not in the duration of the experiment. But homonchus also has a, a larval stage where it burrows in and go, basically goes to sleep in the tissues of the host where the host can't see it, and comes back out when the other adults die. What we see is that those larval numbers are, are reduced in co-infection, and that we, what we see is that that is an immune-based interaction again. So the black circles and the white open circles are the control and homonchus only groups, so there's no difference between those two groups. But in the group that's mixed infection, the anti-homonchus larval response is is substantially raised. Okay, so we see a mechanism of that interaction which agrees with our hypothesis. So we are now working towards this predictive framework and we believe we've found a, a good method of looking at a predictive framework which will allow us to understand how parasites interact even when we don't know anything about the interaction priorly. So we have shown that prediction is, using our proposed framework, is possible. But the caveat is that we've only tested this once in one, one host species. But in contradiction to our caveat, we have looked in completely different host species. There's no relationship between rabbits and, and sheep. They're not closely related taxonomically. They don't have similar physiologies. There's no prior evidence from this system that the sheep parasites were going to interact. So even though these are economically important parasites that have been studied for years and years and years independently, no one's ever asked, do they interact? And what we've shown is that it can actually have quite substantial effects on the dynamics of those infections. So this paper is going to be coming out shortly. 14th of March is our release date in uh, Proceedings of the, Royal Academy, uh, of the Royal Society sorry, Series B, which I'm really excited about because it's been a long-standing piece of work. So importantly, though, just to finish off, I just want to thank my co-authors and our funding bodies. The key thing to, to note is that we now have a step forward in being able to predict all of those confusing interactions that potentially we can see in nature. So we have a way forward to potentially looking to clinical and veterinary mechanisms for treating co-infections together. Thank you.